Hey everybody, I hope you had a great spring break. I'm sorry that I don't get to see you in person this week, but I am looking forward to being back with you next week. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders. You need to make sure that you complete the participation link for this um, lecture no later than 6 p.m. on Tuesday, March 9th. Uh, make sure that you get that in. I will be recording participation that evening for um, class credit. So make sure that you do that. Throughout the lecture today, I'm gonna to give you three code words. And so you need to listen for those, maybe have um, a pen and a sticky note or something to jot it down as we go through so that that way you have those for the participation link. On Thursday, you're going to be meeting in your small groups to work on your interpretation activities. I want to reiterate that you need to read the directions carefully for that activity. You have a blank form and you have the directions and at the bottom of the page of directions are a list of passages that you and your group can choose from. You only need to choose one section. Uh, please don't do all of them, uh, but choose one passage and analyze that parable together. Make sure that everyone has done their own work, um, but you can collaborate. So yeah, um, and then you'll turn in your individual uh, assignments to the folder on my fire. That will be interpretation activity number two. So make sure that you turn it in in the right folder. All right, with that, let's get started and let's talk about the gospel according to Luke and John. The gospel according to Luke, I wanna give you a quick overview of it before we dive into some specifics. Luke is the first of two scrolls that were often uh, put together. And it's the first scroll and the two volumes together comprise about a quarter of the New Testament, which makes Luke Acts, when put together, the largest New Testament book. Um, even separately, it means that Luke has actually written the most as far as volume goes, uh, sorry, not volume, as far as word count goes, um, than any other New Testament writer. Uh, Paul has written the most number of books, uh, and they're really letters, uh, but Paul's written the most as far as numerically, but as far as the amount of content within, a lot of Paul's letters are really short, and so they don't add up to as much as Luke acts. Originally, uh, when Luke, so sorry guys, <laughs> I'm gonna try not to yawn through the lecture. It's been a really long day. Um, when it was originally composed and sent to um, its recipient, it's named. Uh, and uh, that is unusual for new, well, no, that's not unusual for New Testament books. It's unusual for the gospels. So it is um, unique that this particular gospel was composed for a particular person. Uh, that person is named at the beginning of Luke's gospel and his name is Theophilus. This is a common Greco-Roman name. Um, so you may have heard some theories that maybe it just means like the brother of God, which is what that name actually translates out to, uh, but that's not that's not likely uh, because it was a really common name. So when they were originally composed, Luke Acts was sent as a unit to Theophilus, and they were read as a single narrative, not separately as we do today. Um, Theophilus, I said it means brother of God. It actually means beloved by God. Sorry, you guys, it's late. <laughs> um, it means beloved by God. Um, and some suggest that his name uh, was received after being baptized a Christian, like he had a name change. But um, as I mentioned a couple of seconds ago, this name was really common in antiquity um, among both Jews and Gentiles. So we have to remember that uh, the term Theo in, or Theos in Greek just means God and the Greeks and Romans had lots of gods, and so the term was not uncommon to them. The story of Luke um, is the offer of salvation to those on the outside, uh, those who have been marginalized by society. This is interesting because when Luke refers to Theophilus at the beginning of his letter, we get the idea that Theophilus has a really high social status. Uh, Luke refers to him as most excellent Theophilus. That title identifies him as someone who has a higher social rank than Luke. 
Um, and so it's possible that person was a member of the equestrian order, which we have not talked about yet, but we're going to talk about when we get to um, Paul's letters. So just know that it means he's probably a member of the upper class. The readers of the book, of the, of the gospel, are most likely Gentile readers. We know that because when Luke presents Jewish customs, he includes explanatory phrases. So he will tell them, you know, why the Jews are doing this particular thing, um, why this is the custom. That helps us to um, identify the readers, not just Theophilus, but the other readers of the gospel as uh, most likely Gentiles who are unfamiliar with Jewish customs. The way that Luke traces genealogies all uh, Jesus's genealogy all the way back to Adam instead of Abraham also underscores that salvation is not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. And now you get your first code word. The first code word for today's lecture is doctor, uh, because many people think that Luke was a physician. That's how he's referred to in the book of Acts. Um, so the first code word is doctor. Uh, Luke's literary form is important, and there are four principal sections that we want to pay attention to as we read through Luke's gospel. Um, he focuses first on Jesus's infancy and John the Baptist's ministry, uh, then moves into Jesus's ministry in Galilee, where Jesus is presented as very popular. Um, crowds of people follow him. Then we move into the travel narratives, and it's at this point that it almost seems like Jesus's ministry is starting to fail. He's facing more and more opposition. Um, things don't be, seem to be going the way that the readers might expect it to be going. And then the work culminates in the, um, the week in Jerusalem, Jesus's passion and his resurrection. There are a couple of important features in the literary form that I want you to pay attention to. The first one is the methodology. This is not something that we normally talk about when we talk about the Gospels, because Luke's work is unique in this. Um, Luke emphasizes that Jesus has fulfilled God's plan about which many have written. And so when Luke writes his Gospel, the way that he writes it, we become aware of the fact that there are stories already circulating, uh, both orally and in writing, about Jesus's, uh, Jesus's um, ministry and his work. Luke also notes that his sources are eyewitnesses and servants of the word, and that he has investigated um, these stories carefully. He wants to do that in order to give Theophilus and others an accurate and orderly account to confirm them in their faith. And so Luke's goal here is to present a very organized case for who Jesus is and why we should sit up and pay attention to him. Um, in Luke, Jesus's birth is a direct challenge to the imperial claims of Augustus Caesar. And so we get this sense of political undercurrents throughout Luke's gospel. Not only do we have this direct challenge to the imperial claims of Augustus Caesar, but we also have John's ministry fulfilling the Old Testament expectation of Jesus, of, of a harbinger to, to precede the coming of the Lord. This idea that someone is going to come ahead of the Messiah and prepare the way for the Messiah. So there's definitely some political uh, things going on. John the Baptist's message is that judgment is near and all are called to true repentance and to conversion, which then results in compassion and justice. Um, I think oh, in, my new, in my Old Testament class, uh, this week's lecture, we talked about Esther and the idea of faith bringing responsibility. And I think we see that come into play in Luke's gospel as well, um, particularly through John the Baptist's message that um, when we are called to repentance and we respond um, and we, we change our ways, um, or we allow the Holy Spirit to change our ways, then that should result in actionable, um, visible manifestations of what that conversion looks like in our lives. And for the biblical story, that means compassion and justice. Um, and we see that all throughout scripture. We also get a summary of the Galilean ministry that um, Jesus's ministry is done in the power of the Spirit that he engages in vigorous teaching 
and that he is praised by all. And you will want to make note of those three things. So when we talk about Jesus's ministry in Luke, um, we have three different sections, uh, as I mentioned on the last slide. We've got the beginnings, we've got the journey to Jerusalem, and then we have the endings and the new beginnings. Scholars suggest that the beginnings um, in Galilee deals with problems that revolve around the conflict within the Jewish leadership and the question of the nature of discipleship. And so in this, this section, we have um, Jesus calling his disciples. We have him demonstrating his authority to heal and forgive um, and proclaiming the message of the kingdom. The climax of this particular section is Peter's confession. Now, in the whole work, uh, this is not the climax. This is what we might call the turning point um, because it's from this point on that then it flips and where we've been building up, Jesus has been really popular. Now we start to kind of move away from the popularity and into the, tribula the tribulation that Jesus and the disciples are going to face. Most of the unique information in Luke's gospel comes to us in this second section, the journey to Jerusalem. This section highlights the conflict between Jesus and the leaders of Judaism. And that conflict circles not only on the, the nature of discipleship, but also in how do we interpret the law of Moses faithfully um, as the people of God. The leaders of Judaism try to trap Jesus and his disciples in reaction to his dramatic moves. Uh, when he cleanses the temple, they question his authority and they question the authority of John the Baptist. Um, at different points, they're gonna question Jesus's authority. And we see this as kind of a give and take um, where they will question Jesus' authority and then Jesus responds to them with a question. Um, and then they're unable to answer his question. And in an honor-shame culture, this is important because it's kind of like um, with your mom, you know, whoever has the last word wins um, and your mom is always going to get the last word, right, growing up. Um, but the idea here is that Jesus always ends with the last word. The authorities are unable to counter his response to them. When Jesus' authority is questioned, particularly when he's in the temple, he responds with a parable um, that indicates that the Jewish leadership is on its way out. He then talks um, in a teaching about paying taxes, and he gives a teaching about the resurrection. In these controversies, Jesus responds with such wisdom that the opposition is silenced. This is going to be important to Theophilus and the other Christians who are reading Luke's gospel who need to understand that the crucifixion is a travesty of justice, um, which is why as we move into the endings in the New Beginnings section in, God, in Luke's gospel, we see that the passion account is about the absolute innocence of Jesus. Um, the idea that everything that was done to Jesus was done unjustly. And so we want to pay attention as we move into this end section of the crucifixion and the resurrection that we pay attention to how Luke talks about Jesus and how he portrays the story of what's going on. Crucifixion in the Greco-Roman world was the worst form of punishment that the Roman Empire could dole out to someone. Uh, Roman citizens were actually exempt from crucifixion. If you were a Roman citizen, you could not be crucified. Um, you were usually beheaded, uh, which is how Paul dies. Um, but the crucifixion is considered the most cruel and disgusting penalty, as Cicero talks about it. Um, we see this really terrible death of Jesus um, in the most horrific way that the Greco-Roman world understood death. And so that's why um, Jesus's innocence has to be affirmed in Luke's account so that these Gentile readers understand that even though Jesus faced the death of a criminal, he himself was not a criminal. Then we come to the resurrection story in Luke. And in Luke's gospel, the first witnesses of the resurrection are women, uh, which is important. Uh, 
Luke's gospel particularly focuses on the role of women in Jesus's ministry and really affirms their role um, as fellow disciples, uh, not as second class citizens. Uh, the story of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, ends with the encounters of Jesus with the disciples on the road to Emmaus and his appearance to the disciples where he gives them tangible uh, evidence that he is not a ghost. He's, you know, he appears in the middle of a locked room and the disciples are kind of freaked out because Jesus just appeared in the middle of a locked room and they're like, listen, only ghosts to do that. Um, and so he says, no, 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 you know, reach out, touch my hands, feel that I, I have a, a physical body. He eats meals with them. Ghosts don't eat meals. Um, and so he, he proves to them that the resurrected body is a physical body. The final account in Luke is the ascension of Jesus, uh, which then stitches uh, Luke together with Acts because Acts is going to pick up uh, right with that same story um, and, and talk about Jesus' ascension. All right, let's talk a little bit about the particulars of uh, Luke's gospel. So the book, the gospel of Luke names its recipient, but it doesn't name its author. Um, we know that external evidence points to Luke, who was a travel companion to Paul. Uh, the author of Luke really seems to be um, someone who is Greek, um, or possibly some scholars think maybe a Hellenistic Jew. Um, but the idea for most of uh, antiquity and into um, more recent scholarship is that the, um, the author of Luke's gospel was a Greek, um, possibly a God-fearer, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit when we get to Acts. Luke's gospel is highly influenced by the Septuagint and doesn't give us any direct um, evidence that the author has familiarity with the Hebrew scriptures. We say that because um, when we translate things from one language to another, uh, word order gets changed and phrasings get changed just a little bit in order to maintain continuity with the thought behind what's being translated. And so the scriptures that are quoted come from the Septuagint uh, translation, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament not from the Hebrew text. Um, and we can tell that by the way that it's structured. So um, that gives us the indication that this gospel was written either by a Greek or a Hellenized Jew. Um, because we know that the same person who wrote Luke also wrote Acts, that kind of narrows down our options because in Acts, we get some first person accounts. And so this has to be a person who has traveled with Paul throughout his travels in Acts. Um, and the author names other people who travel with Paul and refers to them in the third person. So Silas, Timothy, Mark, Barnabas are all referred to in the third person. So we know that that person is not the person who's writing this gospel or the book of Acts. The point of view in Luke's gospel is, is all third person because Luke wasn't there to witness Jesus uh, as an eyewitness. But in Acts, we get some sections that are uh, written in first person. And so that indicates that the author was an eyewitness of some of the events in early Christian history. Um, some scholars say that that was possibly like an invention of language, that it's, um, a literary turn in order to bring the audience in. But the simplest solution is probably the correct one that the person who is writing in first person was actually there. Uh, we encounter Luke in Paul's letters from Rome, which makes his authorship plausible, but not concrete. Um, and we also encounter Luke in the book of Acts. The early church affirmed that uh, Luke wrote the gospel uh, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, the Muratorian Fragment, which is our earliest collection of the New Testament canon, and Jerome, who is the person who translates the New Testament from Greek into Latin, when Latin becomes the common language. Um, and all of them refer to, Luke, to this as Luke's gospel. So pretty early on, we have this, this community consensus. 
Uh, Jerome refers to Luke, a physician of Antioch, as his writings indicate, was not unskilled in the Greek language. Now I wanna take a second um, and expound on this because in learning Greek, I always hated having to translate as an early Greek student, uh, Luke's writings because Luke's Greek is really eloquent Greek and that makes it actually a little more difficult to translate. Um, so uh, it's, I think it's funny that Jerome says he was not unskilled in the Greek language. Like it's kind of an understatement, Jerome. Um, Jerome goes on to say he was an adherent of the apostle Paul and a companion of all his journeying. He wrote a gospel. Um, and so we see uh, Luke as a participant relying on sources to garner information. Uh, he is aware of other gospels. He talks about other writings of Jesus. Um, and some of the events he describes, he says, are handed down as sacred tradition. And so this has, which we talked about, um, gosh, it's been a couple of weeks now, but when we talked about the language of tradition, and the way that oral cultures will frame certain things in order to communicate um, with reliability. And so this uh, sacred tradition we see uh, being handed on very early in the church gives us some understanding of the way that the early church was structured. The audience is those who are inside the church. Uh, this is not an evangelistic as we might consider uh, evangelism today. This is not an evangelistic letter. This is a letter written to people who are already Christians, and it's written in order to affirm their faith and the teaching that they have received. Paul uses the word certainty quite a bit, and that's a favorite term in antiquity, which denotes a true philosophy as opposed to a superstition. And so Luke is telling them, listen, this is not superstition that we're telling you. These are things that actually happened. The earliest date for Luke's gospel is probably around AD 62, um, although there are some arguments for both earlier and later dates. All right, let's talk about the gospel according to John. John's gospel uh, is set up uh, with a particular setting. The setting of John's gospel is most likely Ephesus. Uh, tradition tells us that John is in Ephesus when he writes this gospel and that John was the leader of the church in Ephesus for some time. The audience of John's gospel is facing persecution as well as internal and external conflict. And so John writes to them in order to communicate what it means to be the people of God in this new context of Christianity what it means for the spirit to transform their lives so that they can reflect um, the gospel to those around them. The book is divided into two main divisions. The book of signs is chapters one through 12 and the book of glory is chapters 13 through 21. The book of signs is named after Jesus's revelatory miracles or signs which accompanied his teaching. Um, and Jesus teaches diverse audiences and um, does a lot of work in public during the book of signs. In public, Jesus is showing signs, he's teaching um, to this diverse audience, and we see several different things inside the book of signs. Uh, we see Jesus referred to as the eternal logos or logos, uh, which means word in Greek. John doesn't include a genealogy like Matthew and Luke do. John writes that Jesus is the eternal word of God from the beginning who took on flesh. Then we get John the Baptist identifying Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And John's disciples then go and follow Jesus. We see Jesus and uh, his interaction with Jewish institutions and festivals. Uh, he frequently replaces Jewish symbols with himself, uh, such as when he calls himself the true bread, which came down from heaven, uh, referring to the manna that the Israelites received in the desert, or the true vine, which is a common symbol for Israel in, um, in some of the prophetic literature. In the book of glory, we move into Jesus's last week. We get the Passover meal, um, John tells about the foot washing of the disciples and the betrayal of Judas. Of Judas. Uh, 
Um, and then Jesus turns in private to his disciples and gives them some really lengthy teachings about servanthood. Um, John's gospel probably has the longest passion section um, as far as it covering, it really is half the book. Um, we see also this farewell discourse, which are uh, Jesus's final teachings and what we call his priestly prayer when he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, Jesus comforts the disciples. He explains the coming of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus to them and remind them of um, the truth that he has spoken to them, that the Holy Spirit will sustain them in the face of persecution. Jesus prays for the disciples. Uh, he gives final teachings about being the true vine. He gives them information about the role of the world and how they should understand and view the world, the work of the Holy Spirit, and hope for the future. Then we move into the sufferings of Jesus, his arrest, his interrogation, his crucifixion, and his burial. Jesus steps forward and gives orders at his arrest. Um, he is really portrayed as in control and authoritative. Um, he asks questions at his trial. That was not common in those days. And then we move into the resurrection and the epilogue. Um, the key word of John's gospel is our. Um, he uses it frequently. And there are seven I am sayings in the book of John um, that you need to be familiar with. Um, in the, I'm going to back up just a second. Uh, the end, I want to talk about the internal markers. Uh, the way that Jesus redefines the elements of each of the Jewish festivals. So there's three uh, main Jewish festivals that all Jews participate in, and they're expected to go down to Jerusalem and, um, and offer sacrifices. Um, Jesus at the uh, Passover uh, defines himself as the bread of life. Um, at the Festival of Booths or Tabernacles, um, he reveals himself as living water and the light of the world um, at the Temple Rededication um, and Jesus' consecration. He also takes the Sabbath, which is the weekly uh, festival, if you will. It's not really a festival, but it's the weekly celebration of God's provision and God's sovereignty in the lives of the Jews. And he redefines what it means to work on the Sabbath and what it means to rest on the Sabbath. Uh, what is what is allowed on the Sabbath? Jesus really redefines that in John's gospel. Um, Jesus and the narrator frequently refer to the hour. Uh, as I mentioned, it is a key word um, in the gospel. And there are seven I am sayings. I finally caught back up to where I was. Um, these are important for you to know, and I'm going to list them for you, uh, but they're also in your textbook. So you're going to want to go back and make sure that you know these because they're going to show up later, I promise. Um, Jesus calls himself the bread of life, the light of the world, the gate for the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, and the true vine. The other thing that we need to remember is that I am also refers to the name of God in the Old Testament. Uh, Yahweh uh, tells Mo when Moses says, who should I say who sent me? Um, when God tells him to go and tell the Israelites that he's going to free them from their Egyptian bondage, uh, God says, I am who I am. Um, and so in some cases, Jesus says, I am statements are kind of ambiguous. Um, and sometimes they're very direct. Um, sometimes Jesus is like, I am, don't be afraid, uh, which is in uh, 620. It's, it's kind of fun. So, all right, uh, code word number two coming at you, and it is logos. It is spelled, I'm going to tell you how to spell it, L-O-G-O-S. Logos is the Greek word for word. All right, so you got that down? Uh, let's talk a little bit about the theological themes in the uh, in the Gospel of John. Um, those G's and J's get you sometimes. Um, let's talk about the first theological theme. Uh, God appears in human history. Uh, John 1 is this really poetic uh, discourse 
on God's role as the sovereign creator and Jesus's role from the beginning. Um, John says in, in 1, 4, in him was life, uh, him being Jesus, and the life was the light of all people. And when that light shines in the darkness in verse 5, um, it says the darkness of the world does not comprehend it. Uh, John writes um, and he tells his audience why he's writing. He says at the end of the book, uh, I'm writing so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so we get this idea of life and light all throughout John's gospel. Uh, John's audience receives mature teaching. Uh, the, this is a group of Christians who have weathered quite a few storms. Um, it's a well-established church in Ephesus. And so his audience is ready for some meteor teachings, um, which is why John's gospel is so different from the other gospels. Uh, the other gospels are written uh, kind of like to baby Christians. And so um, this gospel is written to a more mature crowd as far as faith maturity goes. Uh, John offers mature thoughts and addresses practical problems as questions and problems arise in the church's early development. We see um, the identity of the Messiah as a theme in John's gospel through John the Baptist uh, as a messenger preparing the way. Uh, John's, John the Disciples gospel affirms that John the Baptizer is not the Messiah or the light and that Jesus is superior to John. Some of John the baptizer's disciples become Jesus's first converts. Um, John himself confesses that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We also see in John's gospel a real development of what will later become very important um, for theology in the church and understanding how we talk about God and how we can have a monotheistic faith uh, when you have more than one person in the or more than one member of the Godhead. Uh, you know, how can you have God the Father and God the Son and say that you're only worshiping one God? Because that's two. So um, John's gospel really helps us to put some uh, firm language to understanding the person of Christ. John affirms the oneness of Jesus and the Father. He also affirms their distinctness and their unity and purpose. Uh, John describes Jesus as the word or the logos. Uh, both Jews and Greeks would have recognized this as foundational for the creation and order of the world. Um, in Greek philosophy, the, the word was kind of how the world was ordered. Um, and in Jewish faith, we know that God speaks and the world comes into existence. John says, however, that this divine word becomes flesh and is fully divine and fully human. He is before time and he is in time. And so we start to see kind of this mystery of the nature of Christ uh, being developed in the um, in the doctrine of the early church through John's gospel. Another theological theme in John's gospel um, three actually are the Holy Spirit, uh, the sacraments and the future hope. Um, the Holy Spirit is integral to Jesus's experience of God. Um, a lot of times people, uh, particularly Pentecostals will be like, oh, John's gospel has all the stuff about the spirit in it. And John's gospel does have quite a bit about the spirit in it, but sorry, Luke's gospel has quite a bit about the spirit in it. But so does John's. The Holy Spirit plays a really key role in John's gospel. Um, remaining with Jesus after his baptism um, in John 3, um, he notes that God has given Jesus the spirit without measure, which means you know completely fully. Um, John promises the spirit to believers. Jesus tells Nicodemus that he needs to be born of water and spirit. Um, and Jesus tells his disciples at the end, that if he doesn't go away, the um, advocate, the Greek word there is paraclete, which is like a person who advocates for you, um, that the advocate will not come to you. Um, and then he gives them the Holy Spirit on Easter in chapter 20, verse 22. The sacraments refers to um, 
particularly baptism and what we now call as communion or the Lord's Supper. The incarnation of the word and the presence of the spirit gives worship symbols the properties that they depict. Um, and so we see because of the way that John's gospel talks about baptism and the Lord's Supper, this idea of the, the spirit being present with us when we participate in these events um, or these symbols, that that is really important to our faith. Um, taking communion is a form of grace, um, you know, that God's presence is with us um, always, but particularly in a special way uh, when we participate in communion and we, we recognize and remember um, and celebrate the way that Christ has sacrificed for us and the way that he continues to move in our lives. Um, our future hope, uh, I'm going to give you a real fancy theological word here. It's called eschatology. Uh, eschatology has to do with the study of how things will end, um, the study of end things. Uh, in John's gospel, we see that the longed for presence of Jesus is given to us now in the spirit. And so where the other three gospels have kind of an apocalyptic hope of Christ's return, uh, which is important and is a key element of our faith. But we also have in John's gospel, this realized hope that even though we are waiting for Jesus's physical return to earth, while we're waiting, we're not left alone. We have the spirit with us. And so there's this tension between the now presence of the spirit and the not yet fulfillment of Christ's return. Uh, John's gospel has quite a bit of irony. And I actually, this picture here, I hate that the little camera is covering it up. It's just water behind my face. Um, but this building, this gray building, um, is the um, place where um, part of John's ministry was supposed to have taken place. This is on the coast of Ephesus. In John's gospel, we get a clear picture of Jesus. And through that picture, we see that many people either misunderstand Jesus or come to the wrong conclusions quickly about him, or they reject him. Sometimes they debate about who is this Jesus? What's going on? Why is he doing these things? And so we see the responses of people to Jesus and that those responses are not always positive. Um, the crucifixion in John's gospel is the peak of the irony that we see in that Jesus is called the king of the Jews by Pilate, you know, a Roman uh, governor. And uh, the Jews are like, uh, no, he's not our king. Like they actually go and they ask Pilate to take down the sign that he's put up that says the king of the Jews. They're like, listen, if you're gonna put that up, say this man called himself the king of the Jews. He's not our king. Caesar's our king. And that is a whole different level of what's going on um, among the leadership in Jerusalem. But the idea that um, the Jews are rejecting Jesus as their king at the crucifixion, uh, while this Roman uh, leader is acknowledging Jesus as the king of the Jews is really ironic, um, if you think about it. Irony also plays into John's dualism as the darkest, darkness can't comprehend the light and the world can't comprehend divine revelation. And so this, this kind of contrast between light and dark and the world and believers um, plays throughout John's gospel. So I wanna take a second to talk about the world in John's gospel because just like um, our in John's gospel, which is a key word, the world is also one of John's key words. It's one of his most frequently used words. And the Greek word is cosmos. Um, in 110, John tells us that uh, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. And in that, it's talking about both the universe itself and humanity. So sometimes cosmos just means humanity uh, sometimes it means the universe, and sometimes it means both in John's Gospels. Uh, this term is used 78 times in John's Gospel and 24 times in his letters. 
in John's gospel, we see um, that Christ and uh, through Christ, God uh, loves the world, um, that Jesus dies to take away the sin of the world, uh, that Jesus wants his disciples to have an honest assessment about the world, um, that he wants his disciples to understand that they're going to be despised by the world, uh, that the spirit will fight against the errors of the world. Um, Jesus comforts his disciples in um, chapter 16. He says, you know, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Um, and so this is a really um, prevalent theme throughout Jesus's teachings. We see that uh, Jesus indicates that the world is good. And that goes all the way back to Genesis. You know, when God created the world, um, he said it's good. And sin broke that, but it didn't take away the basis of goodness of God's creation. So the world is good, but it's dead in sin and it's under Satan's rule. And so Jesus dies to take away the sins of the world. And the world and the Jews in John often have similar connotation. Um, there's a little bit of um, discussion about this in that um, the Jews are often referred to in a negative light uh, by John, which is interesting because if the author of the Gospel of John is the beloved disciple, then he's Jewish. Um, but the idea is uh, most of the time when it's a, a negative discussion of Jews, it's likely the Jewish leadership that John is actually referring to and not kind of the entire corporate group of Jews. So that's something to be aware of as you read through the Gospel of John. Let's talk a little bit about um, the author and date for, the, for John's Gospel. So in John's Gospel, the author is technically anonymous like all of our other Gospels. Um, but the way that it's phrased, we get this kind of enigmatic figure who was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, the title appears six different times, and it says that that one is the one who testifies these things and who wrote them down. And we have several different suggestions of who that person might be. Um, some scholars say it's just an idealized literary figure that it's not really a real person. I'm pretty sure it's a real person. Uh, some say it might be Lazarus, that it might be John Mark uh, or Thomas. We do know that whoever it is is one of the 12 and that that person formed an inner circle with James and Peter around Jesus. This explains his eyewitness testimony and his penetrating insight into what's going on because he's part of this core group of disciples. Um, so John of Zebedee is the, is the traditional and the best solution because he fits those characteristics. It's possible that he was Jesus's cousin. And we say that because um, he gives him charge of Mary at the cross. And so it's likely that he was um, that he was Jesus's cousin, that there was a relationship there that was an actual kinship relationship um, because he wouldn't have done that otherwise. The synoptics uh, mention John more often with Peter than any other, and in Acts, uh, they're companions in Jerusalem and in Samaria. And so we see John and Peter together quite often, which gives us again this idea that they're part of that inner core. Um, many of the church fathers point to the Apostle John as the author of John's Gospel. Uh, Irenaeus in AD 200 says that the, that the beloved disciple was John and that John wrote from Ephesus. This is important, and let me tell you why it's important, uh, because we don't have a lot of hard evidence as far as, you know, original manuscripts. Those have all been destroyed by weather and persecution and different things, but we have a direct line. Um, so imagine that uh, your grandparent, uh, let's say your grandfather, knew, um, I'm trying to think like a good time time uh, period. Okay, let's say your grandfather knew Martin Luther King Jr. And so your grandfather says to you, says to your father, um, 
I knew Martin Luther King Jr. and this was his favorite knock knock joke. Okay, it was something random. Okay. Um, and then your father tells you, Grandpa knew Martin Luther King Jr. and this was his favorite knock knock joke. You're going to trust that line of succession. Um, and so we have a similar line of succession in understanding who wrote John's Gospel. So Irenaeus knows personally Polycarp. Polycarp was the Bishop of Smyrna um, it, from AD 69 to 155. And he was tutored by John, okay? Uh, Eusebius, a uh, hundred years later uh, in 300, so Irenaeus is in AD 200. So Irenaeus is um, directly connected to Polycarp. Polycarp is kind of his mentor. And Polycarp's mentor was John the disciple, the beloved disciple. Um, you guys say beloved. That's how it, it's not beloved, beloved. Sorry, little side note there. There's a song, but I'm not going to sing it because my voice is froggy and you don't want to hear that right now. You want this lecture to be done. That's what you want. <laughs> All right, here we go. So Irenaeus in AD 200 knows Polycarp very well. Polycarp is mentored or tutored by John, the beloved disciple. In AD 300, Eusebius, who gives us a lot of early church history records, um, records that same group of connections. And so we have, you know, a hundred years later, still within a reasonable amount of time, um, this connection affirmed again. Clement of Alexandria, who um, lives in a, and is um, a leader of the church in AD 200, confirms John's association with the gospel and the Muratorian canon, which we've talked about already, is our earliest list of authoritative New Testament books. Sorry, it's late, you guys. All right, uh, the Muratorian Canon, composed sometime between AD 180 and 200, um, also confirms that John is the author of the gospel. Okay, the latest possible date then is AD 110. Um, and that's if you don't think that John wrote it, uh, really. If John uses the synoptic gospels, then he probably writes it sometime between AD 70 and 80. Now, and I forget the church father's name at the moment. It might be Jerome, but it might be Eusebius. Um, one of the early church fathers notes that John's gospel is different because he wanted to write about Jesus in ways that the synoptics, that the synoptic gospels had not addressed Jesus. And so that early witness kind of gives us the idea that even if John doesn't use the Synoptic Gospels as sources, that they are already in existence when his gospel is written. So that means probably sometime between AD 70 and 80, um, which would make sense in the timeline of things, especially if you see John, uh, the beloved disciple, as the author of Revelation, which we'll talk about when we get to Revelation at the end of the semester. Um, if it was written before the Synoptics, then probably sometime before the War of AD 70, um, but I am going to go with church history on this one and say that it is, is somewhere between AD 70 and 80. So, um, and now it's time for your third code word, which is disciple. Um, so that is your third code word, disciple. And here is your participation link. Um, I don't know if you are able to click on this link from the video or not. Um, hopefully you can use the little QR code, but I'm also going to put the link in the announcements page on my fire. Um, so you probably have actually seen the participation link before you've seen this lecture, um, but you can find it there as well if for some reason you didn't see it there. So that's all I have for you. I will see you all next week. Have a fabulous rest of your week. And if you have questions about the uh, interpretation activity, please email me. Um, listen, I'm sitting in a lecture all day on Thursday and I'll probably have my email up. So if you have questions, I am happy to um, answer those questions for you. So that's all I have for you. Have a great one, guys.